All right. Uh, so welcome to Toronto Data Workshop, everyone. Uh, today's guest is Kobe Hackenberg, who is at the Oxford Internet Institute at the University of Oxford. Uh, he's going to talk about evaluating the persuasive influence of political micro-targeting with large language models. Uh, he's a research candidate, PhD candidate at the in social data science at the Oxford Internet Institute. Uh, his doctoral research is funded by the Clarendon Scholarship and is so supervised by Helen Margots and Scott Hale, and it investigates the persuasive influence of personalized AI systems. More broadly, his work lies at the intersection of computation, language, and society. And he just mentioned that he has one year left. Uh, so I guess uh, in a year, please um, please do apply for our jobs at Toronto, Kobe. It would be great to have you here. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation, Rohan. Um, really excited to talk to you all. And thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, as Rohan mentioned, you guys have had maybe a couple talks sort of in this similar vein, talking about or looking at uh, potentially persuasive AI systems, maybe persuasive language models. Um, and so, uh, yeah, really looking forward to your questions and, and uh, feedback on this work. Uh, Rohan mentioned that you guys might have a slightly more methodological focus, so certainly happy to spend some extra time there, but I'll in also introduce and sort of motivate the work um, and sort of blitz through the results and, and maybe some interpretations. Um, but yeah, like we said, feel free to interrupt any time with questions and happy to sort of dig in at any particular point that's of interest. Um, yeah, so kicking off, I mean, I think it's no secret to anyone that this work sort of, this sort of stream of work sort of kicked into high gear uh, with the launch of ChatGPT um, about maybe 18 months ago. But actually, there was work that was sort of looking at sort of persuasion and, and potential ways that generative language models can influence politics, uh, even for kind of several years before that, even, I would say. Um, uh, that uh, Truth, Lies, and Automation report by, from CSET at Georgetown is a good example. Um, and so, yeah, people have been looking at this for some time, ways that, that sort of automated uh, text generation systems could start to sort of influence political processes by generating compelling political texts and sort of playing a role in distributing them. Um, obviously, though, since uh, these, you know, given the recent sort of advance, there's been increased um, speculation and sort of hype around the potential for LMs to sort of directly facilitate political persuasion. Um, and certainly now in the past 18 months, since sort of the, the um, hype sort of reached fever pitch, uh, there's been work by myself and, and some others uh, that's sort of directly looking at how persuasive these models are um, and pretty conf pretty conclusively shown that these models can persuade sort of at the level of humans, at least um, on most political issues. And there's been sort of commensurate sort of speculation from industry leaders about um, how persuasive these models will be and how soon. Um, and this sort of concern about these language models manipulating public opinion has sort of taken root in the community of AI researchers to the point where most of them rank sort of this uh, large scale manipulation of public opinion as among sort of their top concerns about these generative language models in the coming um, months and years. And then sort of the top AI labs who are responsible for developing many of the most capable models have sort of uh, put out safety frameworks and sort of attempted to start measuring the persuasiveness of their language models um, and, and just generally sort of laying the groundwork for what will surely be sort of uh, a large amount of research on the uh, persuasive capabilities of these models going forward. So that's sort of like the background motivation of this sort of paper. Um, in particular, though, one of the ways that people have theorized that these models will be very persuasive is the fact that they're maybe able to scalably create very tailored personalized content. Uh, and so in the past uh, year, since 2016, uh, in the Cambridge Analytica scandal, there's also been this sort of um, fear or concern about highly targeted political advertising, political messaging, and campaign, political campaigns, and other actors using uh, data, personal data, uh, as a means of creating more persuasive uh, targeted political advertising. And so sort of synthesizing these two sort of growing concerns um, there's been speculation that sort of in this election year, we're going to have a wave of this personalized AI generated content, maybe to personalized fundraising emails, text messages, 
um, social media posts, emails. Um, and the concern has been, or the speculation has been, the question has been, will this sort of dramatically increase the persuasiveness of this sort of messaging uh, in a way that we haven't really seen before or had to encounter before? Um, and so this is the question fundamentally that this paper aimed to address is to see, okay, if you have some personal data and you give it to the language model, is the model able to use this persuasive, this data to sort of enhance its persuasive impact um, sort of directly opposed to a scenario where maybe it doesn't have this data and it's just sort of naively generating persuasive messages. Um, and we hypothesized going into this paper that, yeah, sure, why not? This seems like uh, this would be the case, that if you give a model data, that should only help uh, it be more persuasive. Um, and so that's what we sort of set out to test. Um, so yeah, so we did this sort of broadly in three pretty simple steps. We first, we had to build a web application that was capable of sort of generating these tailored messages uh, in real time. And then we had to deploy this application um, in a large scale sort of human subject experiment and then estimate um, whether this targeting actually had a persuasive impact um, or sort of enhanced the persuasive impact, I should say, of the language models. So I'll sort of uh, go through each of these in turn. Um, and then, yeah, if there's at any point, you know, um, questions or areas where you want me to go in deeper, then I'm happy to. So, okay, building the building out this application, um, first we need to sort of come up with some issues that we we're going to try to persuade on. So we picked four for this uh, paper. Um, we picked these issues to sort of contain a mix of sort of domestic and foreign policy issues. We tried to phrase them so that some were arguing for the policy, others were arguing against. Um, uh, and then we also needed to pick which targetable attributes we were gonna use. So we picked uh, sort of 10 um, pretty common baseline pieces of targetable data um, with a particular focus on the sorts of data that campaigns actually um, keep and use uh, and store about their constituents or, or uh, donors in practice. Um, again, can come back to this if it becomes relevant later. Uh, and then we needed some prompt and system messages to actually uh, get the, the model to generate persuasive messages. So we had basically two conditions, right? We, are, we had more than two, but in general, we had the micro-targeting condition where it's going to uh, pers personalize the message. And we had the best message on the bottom where it's not. And it's just sort of instructed to generate a generic vanilla persuasive message. And so then what would happen is on the prompt side, um, the model would sort of in real time be uh, given a string of these uh, attributes and an issue stance. And then it would be, it would generate a message based on those attributes designed to persuade about that issue stance. Um, so, okay, yeah, uh, we have the issues that we're gonna persuade on. We have the targetable attributes that we're going to use to tailor the messages. We have the prompt and system messages that we're going to use um, to instruct the model to generate these persuasive messages. Um, and then the last part is to sort of put this all together into a, a web application. So the flow we were going for is something like this, where the participants would be onboarded. They would first report this data that we need to know about them to use to tailor the web application or the uh, message, I should say. And then they would be randomized to one of these four basic conditions, right? One condition is going to be the control group where they're exposed to no message. One is the no micro-targeting uh, condition where they're just exposed to a message that's not that's persuasive, but that's not uh, tailored based on any of their unique personal attributes. There's a false uh, micro-targeting condition, which I can get into more later why exactly that's there, but uh, which created a message that was tailored based on attributes that they did not report. And then there's finally the micro-targeting condition, which is the main sort of treatment condition of, of interest. Um, and then after being assigned to one of these, they would obviously see the message or lack of message in the control case. And then they would rate issue support um, and then sort of be offboarded. So this is sort of the flow uh, that we needed. Normally I'd stop there, but since I think you guys are slightly more, you know, uh, methods uh, interest, uh, this is a slightly more detailed sort of like um, procedural flow diagram of the of the application for exactly how this was done. 
So you can see when participants are onboarded, they come, we collect their attributes, and then depending on the condition, sort of different things happen, right? So if you're in the control condition, we collect your attributes, and then we just ask you what your stance is on the assigned issue. If you're in the no micro-targeting condition, you just get the uh, generic um, message from GPT-4. If you're in the micro-targeting condition, you get attributes, the correct attributes are used, they're sent to GPT-4, received by GPT-4, and then it sends the message back. They're, they're shown the tailored message in real time, and then we collect their response. In the false targeting condition, we do that uh, step twice. It's a little complicated, but first we send a key value pair um, of the, you know, a dictionary containing the, the attributes. And then we have GPT-4 basically return a new dictionary with uh, different values. Um, and so this is how we know that the attributes are not the same ones that they reported that are being used to tailor the message. So this is sort of how the, how the application worked sort of behind the scenes. Um, and this is some examples of sort of what the messages generally looked like. Obviously, this is just two examples on the digital privacy uh, issue. But so on the left, you see there's just this is just a sort of generic persuasive message of a couple of paragraphs talking about why it might be a bad idea to strengthen digital privacy. Um, and then on the right hand side is uh, an example message. This is an actual message that it was used in the study for an individual that reported that they were agnostic, they were a Democrat, they were from New York um, and had a PhD. And so you can see sort of in small ways, sort of it sort of starts to work in some of these details into its message. Um, and this is, you know, apparently how the how the micro-targeting uh, seemed to, to manifest in practice. And so then it was all, the only thing left to do was deploy the, the application. Uh, so we have, yeah, as we mentioned before, sort of a four condition between subjects design. Um, maybe one thing to emphasize here is that sometimes um, people within disciplines have are not used to seeing is that um, we don't measure attitudes before and after uh, the treatment, and rather we only measure attitudes after the treatment and then estimate the treatment effect with respect to a null control group. Um, this is to avoid what are called anchoring effects, wherein if you get someone to uh, state their opinion on an issue and then immediately try to change their attitude and then get them to state it again, it's uh, much harder to get them to change or update their belief. Or there's these anchoring effects that sort of hinder an accurate representation of the extent to which their beliefs actually changed. So here, the way we measure attitude change is by looking at the means basically of the control group who saw no message and the treatment group uh, who did see a message. Um, and yeah, that's that's a sort of a standard between subjects, uh, attitude change, des uh, experimental design and political science. Um, so yeah, we had 8,600 participants. They were balanced on the basis of self-reported sex, first language English over the age of 18, had at least a high school degree. Um, and yeah, that was the sample. Um, we split briefly, it up. Oh um, yeah, sure. On that point, so the the trade off that you make that you make there um, is therefore like the sample just has to be larger. Basically, that's the trade off. Um, you give up worrying about asking them before and after, which like makes sense based on your explanation. But the trade off is that the sample just has to be larger. Is that basically the correct thinking? Um, you know, I'm not sure exactly how much larger. Um, oh, okay. I think the sample would have to be pretty large in both cases, just because of the nature of this experiment is, uh, there's lots of conditions. And as you'll see in the next slide, there's sub conditions and we're, you know, testing numbers of different attributes and stuff. So I think you'd have many thousands in either case. It could be true though, that this design is slightly more expensive. Um, yeah. Cool. cool. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, these subjects were allocated sort of, um, proportionally according to a power analysis of, um, sort of what we needed in each in each case with the bulk of the, the participants being sort of funneled into the micro-targeting condition. In the accurate micro-targeting condition on the far right, um, actually we had, you know, five sub-conditions where the messages I would either be targeted based on one, three, five, seven, or nine of the attributes. Um, as you'll see later, we had sort of a sub-question about whether more or less targeting made a difference, uh, more or less data, I should say. Uh, 
And then we have some pretty simple models, uh, simple, lin simple linear models, um, sort of aim to answer the three main three main questions that that we had, which is basically first and foremost, uh, does assignment to this micro targeting condition actually predict uh, more attitude change with respect to um, the false targeting or with respect to no uh, micro targeting? So the reference condition here is. Uh, the no micro-targeting condition. When we visualize it, we have the control as the reference condition to sort of emphasize that all of the messages were persuasive. Um, but yeah, happy to answer any of the questions about these models later. But basically the second one was looking at more targeting versus less targeting. We have two models which sort of similarly jointly answer that question, whether increasing the number of attributes you give the model actually helped it or, or not. And then finally, we look at the type of targeting. So we looked at if targeting on the basis of one particular attribute was maybe more useful or more helpful to the model in crafting a persuasive message than than the others. And yeah, okay, let's go for it. Um, so the main results you can see here on the right side, um, we did not find that accurate targeting had basically any effect whatsoever. Uh, um, well, I shouldn't say it had no effect whatsoever. I, it had no effect above and beyond that of the non-targeted message. Uh, there is no persuasive advantage to the accurate targeting condition as opposed to the naive sort of uh, non-targeted condition. Uh, the false targeting condition where the attributes were were wrong was slightly worse than the than the best message, uh, which is what you'd expect, I think. Um, and yeah, I guess that one thing to note that you might be noticing um, is that the gray bar for the renewable energy issue is sort of null across all three conditions. The reason for that is that the sample um, we had been we had the uh, the valence of the issue stance we were arguing for was such that we were arguing we we're trying to get people to increase their support for renewable energy technologies, and in the sample everyone was already very supportive of these, and so we basically had what amounted to a threshold effect where we couldn't uh, persuade people who were already maximally persuaded on our <laughs> zero to one hundred scale. Um, so that's sort of what's going on there. So you can maybe in your head, maybe update all of the precision weighted means, which are the red X's up slightly um, uh, to get a maybe a more accurate estimate of that, how well this works in cases where there is no threshold effect. Um, but yeah, so this is sort of the banner, the banner finding of, of the paper, sort of our main, our main question. And uh, we, we found no evidence that accurate targeting had a persuasive advantage over um, non-targeted messages. Uh, similarly, though, when we looked at sort of um, does increasing the number of attributes uh, help, we found no evidence of that um, across all issues and and in aggregate. Uh, and you can see here, maybe slightly more clearly, you know, the the persuasive impact of messages targeted on one, three, five, seven, or nine attributes compared to zero, which is the best message, obviously, on the far on the far right. Um, you can see, however, that all, I mean, notably, all of these messages are persuasive, right? So we're looking at around 5% uh, uh, persuasive effect on a 100-point scale um, with that renewable energy issue that's sort of dragging down the, the average. So really probably like 6 or 7% on average um, percentage point of persuasion of persuasive effect um, of these messages. But yeah, the, the quantity of attributes used for targeting didn't seem to have any significant effect on this uh, on this effect. And then finally, we look at the sort of the the particular attributes themselves. Um, and again, pretty pretty consistently find that that none of them really were any better or worse than the other, um, and that none of them outperformed sort of targeting based on no attributes. Uh, and this is yeah, this is true within and, and across issues and um, and in aggregate. So yeah, then I guess I can discuss quickly these these findings, and then um, we can have some Q and A. But just briefly, Kobe, with the oh, yeah, renewables, sure. the with the renewables issue that you sort of you mentioned a lot, uh, was that a deliberate yeah. strategy of yours to like have a baseline thing there, um, as, or, or was it just something that came out? No, so, yeah, no, I wish it was a calculated choice on my part. No, it was it was. Um, it just happened. I was expecting that there would be uh, lower support for that issue overall, 
in my head, maybe thinking that that support for climate change was was uh, more controversial than it ended up being in a in a general population sample. It's kind of um, nice though to have that that issue there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. It worked out nicely. Um, Thank you. So yeah, to to conclude, you know, just in a general sense, we we weren't able to find any evidence that micro targeting with currents LLMs uh, provides a sort of persuasive advantage. But um, I think it's important to note that given that these technologies are going to improve and also the, the sort of ways in which humans campaigns um, apply them will become also more advanced, probably it's good to interpret these findings as more of like a lower bounds for this sort of thing than a high watermark. Um, and I, it's conceivable to me that sort of a future study would be able to to use a more complicated design and, and maybe find a, a persuasive effect. Um, I think in particular, like why why didn't the micro-targeting seem to be working for, for our study? I think there's two like really interesting sort of ways you could look at this, like two batches of arguments you might have that are not mutually exclusive. They could, I think, both be true. Um, the first is that GPT-4 is maybe just not itself strong enough yet of a model to, to do this effectively. Um, you could say that maybe, for example, it needs more help from the prompts, like you have to just use chain of thought or like maybe start with the best message and then tell it to tailor the the already good message. I don't know. There, there's basically a large number of ways you could you could sort of uh, um, try to optimize the exact message generation system using some techniques to maybe try to like get a couple extra, eke out some extra performance gains. Um, you could also argue that, and I, this is what I think is, is probably more plausible, is that uh, the model itself is not actually capable of representing the actual opinion distributions of really fine-grained populations, such that if you tell it, okay, this guy is, you know, 40 years old, he is, has only a high school degree, he's a black man, he lives in Iowa, and he is devoutly Christian, what is he going to think about uh, sanctions on China? Like maybe maybe the model doesn't actually know with that much accuracy what this guy thinks, um, and there's some empirical evidence um, to that effect where they basically told the model to role play as these you know hypothetical groups, and then asked the model to um, take census surveys basically and match the answers the model gave to those that were actually reported by these demographics in the U.S. Census, and it found that the model's answers were totally off compared to what these um, what was actually reported in the census as the opinions of these groups. So it feels to me like that's something that could could plausibly be taking place here is that the models just don't really know accurately um, what these fine grained sort of groups believe. So that's that's sort of one one batch of like model side explanations for why the micro targeting didn't work. But I think another one that's also important is that Microtargeting itself actually might not work uh, nearly as well as as sort of people have thought and and uh, speculated. Um, and there's a bunch of evidence to sort of suggest that this might well be the case. I think there's there's evidence that uh, Cambridge Analytica itself didn't really seem to have actually as much of an effect as people thought. Um, there's some really good empirical work by my friend and co collaborator Ben Tappen. Uh, quantifying sort of in his own uh, study that's also in PNAS on uh, sort of the persuasive advantage of of micro-targeting. And he finds really sort of sporadic issue-specific effects or advantages where like it's definitely not a silver bullet. Um, and you can't always expect that micro-targeting will uh, dramatically work over the single best message of a, of a population. Um, and then there's, there's a really great book by Alex Kopik um, at Yale about... Um, Persuasion in parallel, which uh, whose which uh, whose thesis is basically that, you know, actually there's an, a ton of evidence that humans in general are just generally persuaded by information in the same, approximately the same way, and then this idea of like treatment effect heterogeneity that we find in different messages, is actually just really hard to find and and replicate sort of in an experimental setting. Um, and so yeah, in conclusion, I mean if these could both be true, right? Maybe GPT four is is uh, not as quite as good yet as it needs to be at these micro-targeting techniques. Um, maybe, you know, a more advanced experiment design is, is needed. 
to sort of help it elicit elicit these effects. And maybe also microtargeting itself just isn't isn't that great. And sort of together, it seems to be that these um, uh, mean that yeah, so far in a design like the one we used here, there isn't really there doesn't seem to be a persuasive advantage to microtargeting at all. Um, but of course, there's some caveats to this, and I want to take a minute to think about what future work should what should maybe look at that we didn't look at in this paper, because um, there's a number of things. Uh, first, like I've already mentioned, um, and like some several people mentioned to me on Twitter, there's some more advanced prompting techniques that that uh, you know who knows they they might work a lot better. I'm personally uh, skeptical that you'd see dramatic uh, improvements. I think it's possible that maybe you'd find slight improvements by doing a yeah, uh, you know, multi-stage, like more elaborate sort of prompt optimization methodology. Um, but again, yeah, we shouldn't take my word for it. Like I'm sure it would be a cool, a cool, cool future study for someone to do. Um, again, more issues. We picked four here. You know, it's better than picking one, but I think it would be better to to look at a lot more than four. Um, in especially like more local issues, I think there might be. Uh, maybe more space for the model to sort of hone in and, and personalize sort of a rationale uh, as opposed to some of these like shinier national issues. Again, it's just speculation. I don't know for sure. More models. We picked only one model here, one GPT-4 class model. Um, it was brand new at the time. I had got like early beta access, I remember, to like generate these messages. I was super psyched. Um, now, of course, there's a far, far more models and GPT-4 is, you know, not even the best model anymore. So yeah, I think a future work should probably aim to incorporate into their design a way to test many more than a single model at a, at a time, um, which is, you know, it can be costly and, and uh, costly to do, but I think offers a much more comprehensive picture of sort of uh, what the general landscape uh, looks like in terms of model capabilities. Uh, different targetable attributes. Uh, so there's already a couple other papers that look at um, different sort of attributes, I think. Uh, I think the sort of psychological, like psychometric data is interesting. I also think that it's it seems like uh, having concrete data about the existing preferences of the individuals might really make a big difference here. Um, if there's something like vote history or even like browser history or, or even, you know, self-reported information from the participants themselves about, you know, Hey, here's what I think about this issue. Here's why. Now try to persuade me. You know, that's I think an interesting uh, direction to go down, and it might might yield totally different results. Another big one is that here we look at static messages, right? We look at single shot sort of eight to twelve sentence messages um, of the sort that you'd find maybe in a social media post or an email, a text message. Um, but of course, these models can converse and, and dialogue is sort of a, a big part of their their strength and the way that they'll probably be impl implemented in future campaigns. Uh, it's worth noting that I don't think this has happened yet. I don't think any campaigns are actually have a uh, meaningful chatbot style, um, or at least I haven't seen it or heard about it, uh, tools that are like conversing with voters and attempting to like persuade them at scale. But I'm sure it's coming in the future. And and. Uh, so it would be interesting to see if sort of a more prolonged uh, dialogue with these models gives them more space to sort of personalize their messages over time. And, and you know, we might see more effects of personalization there. That's also something I'm working on in a future project. And then you could say, uh, maybe you just need to fine tune the models uh, for this persuasion task. Maybe you need to fine tune the models on the census data to make sure they're aligned with, uh, you know, these demographics uh, first before you try the fine tuning. Maybe you fine tune them on, you know, Reddit data, change my mind or whatever. You know, there's there's many different uh, uh, hypotheses people have for what sort of data would yield a more persuasive model. Um, again, this is not something that, that has been done yet empirically. I don't think that anyone has fine tuned a model yet to and demonstrated that this has uh, increased its uh, persuasiveness. Um, that is, uh, you know, in terms of uh, frontier models, at least, I'm sure you could you could do so in with a smaller model. Um, so yeah, these are some sort of, sort of general areas where you could expect uh, future research to to go, and and sort of caveats uh, to keep in mind as you interpret the results of this work. Um, but overall, I think, and we think that that it's pretty notable that in this year where you know 40% of the population is going to the polls, and AI is sort of exploding everywhere. 
it doesn't seem like personalization, at least in sort of the context of the the setup we employ here, is going to be some sort of magical uh, bullet of of hyper persuasion uh, that's going to sort of um, dramatically change uh, maybe electoral outcomes or or voters' uh, preferences. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Kobe. That's fantastic. Um... Oh, excellent. Stephen, uh, questions I didn't even have to call. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand and then I'll call on you. But Stephen and Michael. Great. So thanks. That was that was really interesting. Um, I wonder, it's, it seems like a lot of like a lot of your examples of um, like uh, micro targeting are pretty overt. So like um, I, I was struck by the location example where Presumably, like before the you know before the exercise, you prompted the readers for their location or the the participants for their location. So one of them might have said New York, and yeah. then very explicitly in the prompt, it said, "Well, if you're someone from New York, then you know." It, and I wonder, like that, that's pretty overt micro targeting, right? Like the user is going to be very aware that they're being micro targeted, and I wonder then if the kind of right way of interpreting the results isn't that micro-targeting as a whole is um, is ineffective, but just that overt micro-targeting is ineffective. And maybe maybe there are forms of covert micro-targeting that are still effective. Yeah, so it's, it's a great point. And that's something we thought about explicitly. I'm going to uh, cruise back really quickly here to the slide where I had um, the prompt and system messages. And you can see in the system message uh, that we explicitly told it to uh, try to <laughs> not directly reference the details in the message. And we said specifically, the audience does not know that you have information about them. It should not be obvious to them that the messages you generate is being tailored. So we did try. We like told the model specifically to try to be sneaky, um, which is, I think, interesting because, yeah, like you'd want the model to have a capability to sort of be sneaky. Um, I will say that I picked sort of an overt example for demonstration purposes on you know, where I could highlight, you know, very obviously the um, the ways in which the message was being tailored. Not all of the messages were that um, uh, overt, and in fact, some of them you'd struggle to to pick out at all, or at least I do. What's it, what exactly is being tailored? Um, and this is part of the part that makes analysis so difficult, right? Is immediately we want to do like text analysis on these messages to see like what's going on, like what's the model doing. Um, and, and I just don't know, I don't know. Uh, and, you know, I'm curious to hear your thoughts if you have more, uh, about how you'd go about trying to figure out what's actually going on and, and if, if, and how the model's tailoring these, but I will say that, uh, yeah, first of all, we did tell the model to be, uh, covert. We were trying to sort of, uh, test covert micro-targeting and that I think some of the messages are more covert than the one that I, I did pick out, but yeah, your point is very well taken and, and, uh, and yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, and just to quickly follow up, it seems like if you wanted to, like one way of sort of, help, there's a couple, like maybe this suggests a couple further directions for research. I mean, one is to sort of, you know, maybe increase the length of time between users giving the information and then um, giving the results. Because at that point, maybe they'll for at least forgotten what information they've given. But you could also probably ask them after, like whether they thought they're being micro-targeted or not. And that might be useful information to get. Yeah. So yeah, I, I mean, I didn't fit it into this this presentation, but we did we did do that, and we are, uh -huh. in particular we asked uh, who who it was sort of like a meta perception question. We asked who do you think would find the message you read um, persuasive in terms of similarity to yourself. So the question was like someone very similar to yourself, very different from yourself, sort of on that scale. And we did find that you know there to a statistically significant extent, uh, people perceived the micro targeting message as um being persuasive to self-similar others and likewise in the false targeting condition there was you know uh people said someone someone different than me um but but these effects were significant but overall not large i think it was it was like less than 10 percent uh um um overall um 10% deviation i should say from a from a random allocation of of uh responses in this case which we'd expect if the model was not targeting well at all, great. or if yeah. there was no sort of signal. Uh, but yeah, it's a great point. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Michael? Yeah, so I, I have two questions, uh, and, and you sort of got to to it there, uh, one of them. And so the, the first one, the sort of narrower one is, have you done 
either text analysis or just qualitatively looked at uh, the response at the the messages by splitting it by demographics. And in particular, I'm interested, you know, that one of those uh, graphs showed that if anything, uh, targeting on on NATO was uh, was backfiring. Uh, and I wonder if that is, uh, yeah, uh, I think the one just prior to that. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you can tease out what's going on. Is, is this because NATO is something that has switched valence in the last couple of decades, uh, such that, you know, the, the, the very strong uh, pro-military uh, Republicans of the 1990s are different from the the Republicans of today, and I, I wonder if you can can tease that out a bit about what the what the model thinks is convincing to Republicans versus what actually is. Um, and then my second question, and this this is a sort of meta question, but I I think one that's interesting to me is as someone who does survey experiments, um, when I do persuasion experiments, I try not to do to persuade people of things that I don't agree with, uh, or at least that I strongly disagree with. Uh, and I wonder how you think about the ethics of possibly changing minds uh, toward positions that you disagree with. Sure. Two great questions. On the first one, um, yeah. So the first thing I'll say is that this this uh, you know seemingly negative effect on NATO support is, is not statistically significant or really close to being. So that's basically just noise. I, I probably wouldn't read too much into that. Uh, at least I don't think I have the statistical power to, to make claims on that. Uh, but I will say that we did disaggregate these effects on um, the basis of some of these demographic attributes. Um, and I found no significant effects except for age, uh, which is that the micro-targeting worked much better for much older people. Uh, I think between the ages of 45 and 60. And that was the, basically, I you know I split it based on Democrat or Republican, uh, you know, along all of these attributes, and I couldn't find any any difference except for age. So I think you might be onto something there that that that's um, you know these generational sort of differences might be at play, um, and that's something to certainly look into uh, with future research. As for your second point about persuasion, the ethics of persuasion research and and persuading and you know potentially dubious directions, it's a very good point, and it's you know sort of inherent to to work in this vein. Um, I think I, I personally feel that, that, uh, in order to get a balanced estimate of how these models work, I have to be able to be sure that they're persuading, uh, you know, people across the spectrum. And in order to do that, I have to be sort of arguing for, for and against different positions that I may or may not agree with. Um, given the very partisan climate in the U S uh, in particular, I think, um, only sort of, uh, persuading in a Democrat direction would uh, amount to a, a limitation or at least limit the generalizability of the findings. Um, so that's that's my personal opinion on it. But you're absolutely right that there's real uh, and important ethical questions here. Um, to sort of mediate those, uh, we have a really sort of extensive debrief where we go through and we just sort of make very clear to people what happened, what the aim of the study was, you know, what these messages were. Um, we didn't find any instances in our in this study, uh, and it was reviewed by the Oxford Ethics Board um, of misinformation or, or or sort of factual inaccuracies in these messages. But of course, you can't rule out the possibility uh, that this model is going to just make stuff up. Um, and so, yeah, I think it it it's, uh, comes down to a judgment call on the behalf of the researcher if they think the sort of benefits outweigh sort of the gains. And in this case, I think it was a relatively small sample. The issues were. Uh, um, you know, not ones where there was overtly false information on 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 both sides, except for I guess maybe the renewable energy one, which luckily no one was persuaded by anyway. Um, but you're quite right. You know, this is a this, and I think reasonable people could come to different conclusions on sort of uh, where to draw the line on this kind of research. Michael, all good. Uh, okay, I'll go on to uh, Ushnesh and then Annie. Ushnesh? Um, hi. Um, do we know enough about the data sets used to train the models to chase some of your results? 
back to the shortcomings of the data sets that we know that data sets are not diverse or don't reflect diversity of broad, broad populations. And maybe that translates to diversity of opinions and thoughts as well. Um, so yeah, my question is, are there enough metrics on the data sets that are available to connect to some of the findings you've had? Yeah, that's a great point, and I think an important point. I, and I think the answer is no. I, I think in the case of GPT-4, we have no idea really what it's been trained on. We we know it's an enormous amount of text data that probably includes basically every kind of content you can imagine being on the internet. But we don't know exactly, and we don't know in you know the post-training stage the ways it's been sort of uh, tweaked and fine-tuned, which is where a lot of these sort of where it's sort of instilled with a lot of the opinions that it ends up expressing, especially on sort of political topics. Um, you know, this takes place during the reinforcement learning with human feedback stage and, and similar sort of post-training. And again, we don't have any idea sort of uh, what sort of data um, or is being used for this or how it's really being done. So one thing I should have mentioned as another limitation of this study is that it used only a black box sort of closed source uh, frontier model, which uh, while it made sense to me at the time in the, you know, over a year ago when GPT-4 was sort of the only model that people felt really had this sort of like magical performance to it. Um, really, you know, I, I would advocate that more research should be done using sort of open weight models that are uh, where the, you know, what went into them is, is disclosed and we, and we have a better idea of the answers to some of these questions. Uh, yeah, all good. Yeah. Uh, Annie? Yeah, um, I have two questions. So the first you kind of touched on um, near the end, um, but I was wondering how exactly you measured those political um, variables that fed into the um, the model, like the political affiliation and engagement. Yeah, sure. Uh, political affiliation was, it, I mean, it was very standard. It was a, it was a, a multiple choice uh, sort of Likert scale type question that was like rate your political affiliation, I think from like very liberal to very conservative and sort of a five point scale, similar for uh, political partisanship. And then uh, for political engagement, it was also a self report. So, so uh, you know, rate how engaged you feel you are with, with politics. And I think we gave examples of some engagement behaviors like reading political news or watching uh, political debates or things like that. Um, in hindsight, I think a better measure would have been uh, political knowledge, uh, which I could have measured by asking simple questions like who is, you know, you know, what's the job of the Supreme Court and what's, you know, who's currently the uh, vice president of the United States or things like this. And then you could have sort of a measure that's a couple points of how much these people are actually know about politics. And that might be a little more informative. Yeah, cool. Um and I guess, yeah, you kind of alluded to this for future work, but is there any interest in um, getting at those sorts of attributes via like proxy questions or variables, like at, in addition to political knowledge, maybe not asking directly about party affiliation, but asking on a set of opinions um, that might allude to party affiliation, you know, about like big versus small government um, or things like that to sort of map those on to um, an actual legitimate political affiliation afterwards. Um, or do you need that sort of more cut and dry self-report um, that may be less, less descriptive? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think both can both can work, right? I think for our our purposes, um, we didn't have to be that sneaky in 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 collecting the data. I think, I mean, we have post-treatment uh, survey questions where, I mean, people did not realize this was an AI model and they did not really realize that the message was being targeted in real time. I think in like 95% of the cases. Partially, maybe that's a benefit of this study having been done like a year ago. Maybe now it would be a little harder to get away with this kind of thing. Um, but in general, I mean, if you think a question like, um, are you in favor of big government or small government uh, is more informative or might give the model a hint on how to be persuasive to uh, uh, an individual on a particular topic, like if it's particularly relevant for some reason, then I don't see any reason why uh, it would be bad to include those more descriptive ones. Um, in lieu of the more overt like uh, party cues or, or direct party affiliations. And maybe the model gets distracted by really like a cut and dry piece of information like Democrat or Republican. And it sort of just like locks in there and just like gives very cliche sort of um, stereotypical answers. So maybe, yeah, you maybe you're right. Maybe a more nuanced sort of uh, um, 
attributes would work better. I think it could probably go either way at this point. Um, but yeah, my second question was about, um, and again, maybe this is kind of obvious, but um, do you have a sense of, or a, a, a hypothesis as to how well this might work in um, context of like, where there's dependence on a candidate or an individual that has a reputation. Um, Cause I feel like there's, you know, more front of mind would be like, who am I voting for in the upcoming election versus like, do I support NATO, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis? It's a much more polarizing topic, but I feel like it's also, um, you know, there's more sort of information there floating around probably, um, you know, someone's news feed um, or in day-to-day -day discussions. Um, do you think this could be more or less persuasive? Or I guess it's not persuasive. So do you think there's potential that it could be more persuasive in those cases or no? Yeah, it's a good question. So so basically, how do I think these results would generalize to a candidate choice sort of scenario? Yeah, yeah, I guess. Or like party cool, choice yeah. even. Candidate choice, party choice. Yeah, yeah, explicit sort of voting choice. Uh, or political sport. I my personal view on this, my intuition is that um you'd see, you know, similar sort of effects. Like I think you could probably induce or reduce support for a candidate or a party uh by, you know, maybe up to 10 percentage points um using a 10 to 8 to 12 sentence vignette, static vignette generated by language model. I'm not sure that the personalization would meaningfully increase that uh and I, I don't have any empirical evidence that would suggest that it will. But of course, you know, you never know. And I think, you know, many more studies should be done. And, and it could be that, you know, this context is meaningfully different and, and sort of maybe people feel like uh, more amenable to changing their their party affiliation when uh, they feel like the message, you know, understands where they're coming from. Uh, so, yeah, it's the best I can do with that. That's great. Thank you. Uh, if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to raise your hand. Um, but Kirby, maybe while people are thinking, uh, could you talk a little bit about some of the technical challenges that you faced just even hooking this experiment up? At the very least, you must have been having to connect a few APIs and you must have been worried about performance and all the rest of it. Um, can you talk through some yeah. of those challenges? Yeah, sure. I mean, it was it was something that was totally new to me. Um, I was very lucky to have... Um, a friend in the department who was very good at sort of building these web applications and was very patient and helping me um, sort of like learn how to how to pull this off. But yeah, essentially I used uh, a Flask application and I sort of coded it from scratch. Which it's just like a Python framework for building sort of web applications. I would highly recommend it. It's really easy and, and sort of intuitive. Um, so that's where I sort of coded all of the experimental logic. And then I built the front and back end of the application very simply. It's easy to do. Um, in just HTML. And then sort of once I have sort of the web pages, what they look like and sort of what needs to happen, then you can push the app um, and sort of deploy it uh, using any sort of like uh, cloud platform as a service sort of uh, provider. I use Heroku, which I would also recommend. Um, and so, yeah, once the application is then deployed on Heroku, you're absolutely right. Then the problem becomes uh, sort of, um, scaling it so that uh, it doesn't crash when all these participants log on and try to start sending uh, GP uh, calls to GPT-4, um, which did happen, I will say. <laughs> uh, when I started out quite a few times, um, it was very stressful. Um, but the key here is I think there's there's uh, very easy ways to sort of using the Heroku interface, just sort of scale um, how much, uh, what load the, the application can handle. Um, and it costs a little extra money, but it's it's very easy to do. So I don't know, I, maybe with other applications or maybe like if you're using Azure or other sort of cloud services, it's more difficult. But if you use Flask and you use Heroku, it's it's really uh, not a problem as long as you're willing to spend uh, probably around six to 800 pounds to sort of uh, buy sort of server space so that that doesn't uh, crash when all the participants sort of try to climb on. Do you have a sense of how much you spent on uh, API uh, on um, GPT, OpenAI, like API calls and things like that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to say it ended up being around like three or four hundred dollars US dollars, hmm. um, in total. I think I ended up having to generate uh, 
so there's yeah there's 8600 participants and i think you know 90 percent of those needed a message and it because they weren't in the control group and so yeah it amounted to essentially like five or six thousand uh messages and i think yeah that comes out to a few a few hundred dollars or it did at the time but i will say that OpenAI tends to have really generous uh researcher access sort of um programs and, and they're pretty responsive on that front so for most uh small uh academic projects you should be able to get credits to to sort of uh cover that cost uh, we have a couple of minutes left if anyone else has any other questions feel free to raise your hand um but I know we've got a couple of people here who I know are PhD students or are researchers interested in this. Uh, do you have any sort of advice for people who are interested in, you know, similar studies to to yourself? Oh, gosh, yeah. I think the tough thing about doing these studies right now is uh, you have to be quick. <laughs> There's a lot of, a lot of um, interest in these topics and a lot of people studying sort of persuasion and, and sort of the ways that these models influence human attitudes and behaviors. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would say um, just be wary getting into it that you're probably going to have some stressful mornings on Twitter where you see a preprint that's, uh, you know, maybe a little too close for comfort. <laughs> um, but no, in general, I think I, I actually, you know, in all seriousness, I think there will be a ton of uh, important papers that need to be written on this subject. And and I would encourage um, uh, people who actually do want to to do it to, to totally do it because um, it's worth it and there's space to to carve out sort of a niche um, and certainly I'm happy to talk with any anyone who's interested and, and offer sort of more one-on-one -on -one advice about pursuing this kind of research. Because, um, yeah, it is cool, and I think it's really important. Excellent. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions, so maybe that's a great note to end on. Uh, Kobe, I'll just say thank you once again for a fantastic presentation and really appreciate you taking the time to give such thorough answers to all of our questions. Wishing you all the best with your with finishing up your PhD. Um, I'll just have one quick bit of advice, which is uh, a done PhD is, is the best sort of PhD. Huh? So, <laughs> <laughs> get that thing submitted. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us, and uh, hope everyone else has a nice rest of the day. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, guys. Appreciate it.